It's interesting. The, the life of this book originally started out as sort of the tale of their courtship and their first uh, sort of married life together and, of course, the birth of Archie. And as my co-author and I, Carolyn Durand, uh, spent time getting to sort of know the couple through their work and the people around them, we soon started to get a sense of a bigger story that was developing, a couple that were slightly unhappy with uh, some of the difficulties and frustrations that they had within the institution of the monarchy. And of course, as time went by and as, as it transpired, uh, things really changed dramatically. Uh, so this book has really been able to capture what has become really a seismic change for the royal family. It's a historical moment captured in one book and, and one that many lessons are, are there to be learned from. The invasions of privacy that Harry and Meghan have really taken issue with are flying drones over their home to take pictures of Archie and really sort of trespassing on private property to get information. They understand that they're public figures and that their lives are out there for sort of the public to get to know and learn more about. But what we've seen over the last few years is only sections of their lives shared. And what I felt when writing this book was that so much was missing, that we didn't really see them as human beings anymore through the lens of the press over here in the UK. And this book go, goes really to go, go on and humanise them as a couple and show them really as who they are and what they're all about and, of course, the legacy that they're trying to build together. You have to remember that their lives are really sort of involving many people around them. There are those that manage their diaries and their schedules. And of course, when they go away to places like Botswana, there are many people that they interact with. Of course, they stay at sort of public uh, tourism spots. And so you can piece together the details and bring together these sort of beautiful moments that the couple have shared in a very sort of touching and sort of romantic way. Of course, I wanted to for the readers to feel as if they were there in those moments. And some of that has required me going back and forth to certain areas and locations over and over again, really just to sort of build a picture of what that building was like, what artwork was on the walls, what room may they have stayed in and how that room would have seen to them. So it's, it's, it's my best attempt at sort of bringing people into those moments without actually having been there myself. I think we've had a series of ups and downs with the couple. We only need to look back in those very early days of Harry's relationship with Meghan around November 2016 when he issued that statement uh, lambasting sections of the media for racist and misogynistic reporting. And it's really since then that it has been this series of ups and downs. We, of course, had the beautiful moment with the wedding, which I think was really their sort of highest point as a couple. And it was the arrival of the Sussexes. And, and that really marked the beginning of a very exciting new chapter for the royal family. Of course, it meant that the royal family was now able to uh, be representative, to be diverse, to be inclusive, and for Meghan to really be at the forefront of that. But unfortunately, this was also an institution that wasn't prepared for a biracial American woman to marry into it. And as the book tells, there are many challenges that she faced along the way, alongside the hierarchy of the monarchy that made their progress as the Duke and Duchess of Sussex very difficult and ultimately why they wanted to break away from that and do it on their own terms. There are many themes at play here when we look at the struggle that the Duchess of Sussex had. Uh, not only was she a biracial American woman, she also had this Hollywood background. And in terms of ticking those boxes that may ruffle feathers within an ancient institution such as that of the monarchy, she had really ticked all of them. And that made it very difficult for her then, really with some of the things that she faced. But there's absolutely no doubt about it that race did play a role. I mean, we have moments in the book where we even look back on that moment with the uh, Princess Michael of Kent, who wore the Blackamoor brooch for her first meeting with Meghan. Now, was that racism, was that not? That's only for her to really know. But what we can take from that, that there is this perhaps uh, ignorance towards racial sensitivity that took place here. I mean, my, I myself have also had moments uh, as a biracial royal correspondent within the institution. I'll never forget the moment uh, an aide or a senior aide uh, close to the Queen said to me, I never would have expected you to speak like that. And it's some, that level of ignorance, I think, that perhaps made it very difficult for Meghan. And of course, she was also up against uh, a lot of that within the British media as well. 
when women marry into the royal family, they're given this very generous honeymoon period where they're allowed to sort of watch where they take their step and even make a mistake at times because the public really has their back. But with Meghan, we saw that very quickly disappear. She was uh, uh, really within months called Duchess Difficult and she was deemed as uh, too demanding, too aggressive, too loud. All of the things we often see put uh, to women of color um, in very sort of stereotypical ways. And I think Meghan had that to deal with as well as wanting to do things a little differently. We know Harry and Meghan really are an intense couple when it comes to their work. They like to move from one, one project to the next. And the institution doesn't move at that speed. And so they would have felt frustrated regardless of some of these other issues that they dealt with. And when we look at them now and the life that they're living, the projects that they're working on, they're clearly thriving and it's working for them and I'm sure felt like the right move for them. It was around summer 2019 that I first started hearing just how uh, difficult Harry and Meghan were finding certain aspects of their lives as working members of the royal family. And as I followed that over the weeks ahead, it became very clear that some of these problems couldn't be remedied that easily, or there were people within the institution that didn't want to find solutions to these. And so by the time we had got to that uh, trip to Southern Africa, where they did that incredible tour, I think it was at that moment that we knew that Harry and Meghan really were desperate to change the way they worked with the press and change the way they worked themselves. I know that Harry really struggled with dealing with the British media so up close, allowing them into his personal working space was something that he always struggled with. And I know there were conversations that took place behind the scenes where he asked, could I change that? And he was told, only if you pay for it yourself. If you pay for your own work, then you choose how you conduct that work. And so, of course, for Harry, then the wheels start turning in his mind about, well, let's find a solution to that. And so by the end of the year, when we heard that the couple wanted to break away from the royal family and or at least create this half in half out model, that was a result of some conversations that had already taken place and their desperation to change the way that they worked. The matters between William and Harry are, of course, intensely personal, but why I felt it was important to really dive into this in the book is because we had seen Meghan and Kate really blamed for almost driving a wedge between that. We saw this narrative in some of the tabloids of the dueling duchesses and how, of course, it was the women that were the key to the problem. But when we actually look back to what the issues were, it comes down to William, an older brother, and Harry, also now an old brother as well. You know, they're both men in their 30s. And Harry not wanting to play that role of sort of the younger, more subservient brother anymore. I think we have this moment in the book where William gives some advice on sort of to be careful about moving ahead with Meghan at great speed. And, you know, one of the many reasons Harry took offense to that was because he himself is a mature young man now who can make his own decisions and perhaps doesn't need advice at every turn without having asked for it. It's been really interesting to get to the heart of uh, that matter, you know, finding out whether Kate and Meghan really were at war with each other. And I think the story that we really brought out of this book is much simpler. These are two women that really have very little in common. But unfortunately, the issue here between Meghan and Kate really lied on Meghan needing support from the people around her. I think being a newcomer and knowing that Kate was once a newcomer, I think there are times where she, from speaking to sources, knew that Meghan felt that she could have or needed a little bit more support from Kate and didn't get it in some of those important moments. You know, we know that Meghan had a really difficult pregnancy, particularly with some of the stories being spun out by sections of the British media. And it was during that time, I think, uh, a fellow mum, a fellow once upon a time newcomer such as Kate could have really been there to support Meghan but wasn't. And it's for those reasons that we haven't seen a friendship flourish between the two of them. But at the same time, there is no war of words. There is no uh, duel dueling duchesses narrative here taking place. These are just two women that are very different. The way Harry and Meghan left the monarchy was, was abrupt, and I think it took a lot of people by surprise. But we have to look back at that original plan, that roadmap that they put out there in early January. They said they wanted to be half in, half out. They wanted to continue to represent the Queen. They wanted to continue to represent the Commonwealth and really embrace the roles that they had, but also have the freedom to perhaps focus on some of their own work as well and find a way to operate outside of the institution as well. And it was that was really the point in which it broke down because when they were told no, 
that's not going to work. They had no choice other than to leave because they both knew that it wasn't going to continue should they just carry on as they were. So in a way they were cornered into leaving abruptly and it's a real shame because I think it has done a lot of damage for the couple in the UK. We've seen really uh, certainly in this country very polarized opinions on the couple. A lot of people aren't willing to forgive and forget just that yet but I hope that with a book like this it does allow people to see a little bit more of the other side of the picture and get a better understanding of what it is and why it was so important for the couple to make this move not just for their legacy that they wanted to build but also for the family that they really wanted to protect. There's no denying that the story of Harry and Meghan's time as working members of the royal family went by very quickly had it have been slower, it may have played out a little differently. But at the same time, we also saw a couple, and the book really goes into detail about this, that tried their best to make everyone around them aware of the difficulties that they were facing with sections of the British media and also within the institution themselves. And time and time again, they felt that they weren't heard, that they weren't listened to, that their words fell on deaf ears. And I think that what we saw take place earlier this year with the couple very publicly announcing that they needed to step back was a result of their frustrations of not being heard. And so there are really lessons to be learned on both sides. Yes, Harry and Meghan can be a very impulsive couple. We see them really jump from one project to the next, completing each one, but working at a speed that not everyone is used to. You know, the, the machine inside the House of Windsor moves very slowly and it's hard to make things change. But I think if they were listened to very early on, it, this would have been a very different outcome. I think we have to remember that Harry was raised within the institution of the monarchy. He has nothing but respect for the Queen and the monarchy itself. But of course, as we saw after the wedding of the Sussexes, they did also become one of the most popular, or if not the most popular members of the royal family around the world. Their global reach was like nothing else. It was one of the things I really enjoyed about traveling with them on these engagements, was seeing just how diverse a demographic it was that was following them. It, was, it sort of transcended beyond the traditional royal watcher and meeting young girls saying that they could see uh, themselves in Meghan, a, a woman of color standing in the House of Windsor, that was really powerful. And so I think for Harry and Meghan, whilst they knew their place within the institution and how that sort of ladder of hierarchy worked, they wanted to be in a position where they could also harness that popularity that they had and take it into their work. And, you know, for a, for a family that is technically a brand, you know, we call it the firm, it surprises me that there weren't enough individuals within the institution that also wanted to embrace that too. So you can see how then the frustrations begin to grow within the couple who felt that they're capable of so much more than they're doing but weren't allowed to do. It's been very interesting to see sections of the British media react so strongly to this book. Uh, but you only need to look back at some of their own coverage. Uh, they themselves have repeatedly put out what they purport to be the side of the royal family, sources within the royal household, senior aides. We see them quoted anonymously time and time again. This book is simply relying on those people closest to Harry and Meghan. And I don't see what the issue is with hearing another side to that story. It helps us bring together a much more balanced overview of what it is that went wrong. And we've, you know, I've not been surprised to also see commentary coming out of the palace itself. You know, I've seen and recognized some of the voices in these source quotes and some of the British tabloids. And I think what makes me laugh there is that, you know, this is an institution that thrives on never complain, never explain. But I have seen a lot of complaining and a lot of explaining in the recent weeks. Well, my co-author and I spoke to over 100 people to bring this book together over a couple of years that we spent writing it. And these include people that have worked for both Harry and Meghan, past and present, as well as close friends from their past and also their current day as well. I think we've really tried to leave no stone unturned and talk to as many people as possible to get a very balanced overview. But alongside those sources, we've also spoken to people very close to the Cambridges, to Her Majesty the Queen, and also Prince Charles and the Duchess of Cornwall themselves as well. So, And you'll see throughout the book that there are moments that we do get to hear how other members of the royal family felt as well. This, of course, is Harry and Meghan's story, but I think for us to really make sense of it all, we need to know how everyone really felt. I think when we hear people calling Meghan a social climber or that she had some agenda to enter the royal family and tear Harry away from it, 
this is just a lot of uh, sexist and even racist tropes being attached to a woman who has actually achieved quite a lot by herself before even entering the House of Windsor. She was an accomplished actress. She had really been out there in the world do doing a lot when it came to her philanthropic efforts. The woman that we've seen working as the Duchess of Sussex is actually very similar to the woman that we saw before she even met Harry. It's why Harry fell for her. And really what is important to take from this book is that it was Harry that was the driving force behind wanting to change the way that they worked. Uh, as Meghan said to a friend, she had really given up everything to make this work with the royal family. She was prepared to do whatever it took. And it was Harry that really came to that conclusion that it wasn't working anymore. And Meghan, as a supportive wife and someone that emboldens Harry, uh, was there by his side through that, throughout that decision. But I would imagine if Harry also said that he wanted to stay, Meghan would have stuck it out too. She's definitely a fighter. It's been interesting to see, of course, at the moment, there's an ongoing court case surrounding the Sussexes and a lot of talk about them already in the press. As we've seen, they are in lockdown at the moment and they're doing their best to keep their lives private. Uh, I, I don't expect them to react to this book. I don't even know if they would ever want to read it. Of course, it does open up old wounds. But having spoken to sources close to the Sussexes, I do feel that over the last couple of weeks, what we've seen coming out from the book may go towards perhaps uh, driving forward in repairing some of the relationships and the harm that has happened in the last few months. We already know that Harry's talking more with his father than ever before. And uh, whilst things haven't necessarily improved between Harry and William, uh, there is a sense that they will eventually come back together because as sources close to Harry told me, Harry really believes that brotherhood is something that should never be a bond that's broken. And so whilst he may not be talking to William much at the moment, he is hopeful that they can get back to a good place at some point. Well, of course, as the only member of the royal family that went through COVID-19 and, of course, was diagnosed with it and came through miraculously and in great health, uh, Prince Charles, that scare meant, uh, really brought together the family in a way that we hadn't seen in a long time. Despite the distance, despite Harry being over in California or even in Canada as well, uh, it was a chance for Harry, I think, to reconnect with his father. We know that they've been speaking regularly since that moment happened. We know that Harry's been on the phone to his grandmother when she addressed the nation here in the UK as, as it went into lockdown for COVID-19. Harry picked up the phone and called the Queen and just to wish her luck and say that he was thinking of her. And so family really plays and continues to play a very big role in Harry's life and in Meghan's life as well. The relationship between the Sussexes and the Cambridges is still as it was left, and I think it will take some time for that to heal. But as a, a source that knows both couples very well said to me, that time will be a healer, um, but it just may take a bit longer than everyone's anticipating. I think Harry and Meghan know that they're not going to win over everyone. Uh, they really favour what can be quite punchy topics. You know, we see them really focusing on issues of social injustice, whether that's racial injustice, uh, gender equity, talking about uh, climate change and advocating for eco matters. These are things that are quite controversial anyway to some people. And so by really focusing on these areas, they know that they're not going to win everyone over. We see the term woke used as an insult for the couple over and over again here in the UK. And, but they also know that they, to pioneer and to change things and to move things forward, they have to be those people that take the hate and the love from the public and move forward as they plan. I don't think they really are trying to win anyone over. They know who the supporters are and they hope that more people understand what it is they want to achieve as time continues. I think for Harry and Meghan, because everything happens so quickly, the Queen wanted to make it very clear to the couple that they were always welcome to step back into this should they want. Uh, you know, they didn't really have much time to reflect or to really think about everything as it was happening. It moved at a mile a minute. And I remember hearing from a friend close to them just how drained it was that they were at the end of this in, in, on March the 31st when they eventually stepped away. Uh, but I also see a couple that are now thriving in the positions that they have. They're really working on some incredible things behind the scenes. They're getting ready to launch their non-profit organization, Archwell, at the end of the year or at the beginning of next year. And I think for them, they're really facing forward. I can't imagine a world in which they would begin to think about 
entering back into the monarchy. I think if we ever needed proof that Harry and Meghan's love could survive anything, it's looking back on the last year. They've been through so much together and as in, in, individuals. And the one thing that hasn't changed is their unwavering support and love and respect for one another. And I think that that really is something that we see from the very first moments that they met right up until the book finishes. Uh, it has been fun to be able to look back at some of that romance because I think that there are times in which uh, some of the negativity uh, in parts of the tabloid press uh, prevented us from really enjoying what was an incredible love story. And so it's been fun to be able to revisit that engagement story and to learn that they were engaged a couple of months earlier than the whole world knew. And again, I think this helps paint a very human portrait of two people that fell in love, uh, came against uh, really the most uh, challenging of tests and difficulties, but overcame all odds to become and find happiness. Well, hey there, GMA fans. Robin Roberts here. Thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Lots of great stuff here. So go on, click the subscribe button right over, right over here to get more of awesome videos and content from GMA every day, anytime. We thank you for watching, and we'll see you in the morning on GMA.